Hello and welcome to I Didn't Sign Up For This. Carrie, what's up tonight? Hey, Tim. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. Good. I would like to talk about goal setting and Mm. how to achieve the goals that we set. Oh, one of those cutting edge topics that nobody ever talks about. Right. Nobody ever talks about this. (laughs) I feel like it's a very smart topic. Um. (laughs) <laughs> it is. So I decided about well a little while ago that I was going to sign up for a mud run right here in Phoenix, Arizona on the 23rd of October. Okay. And uh, it's, it's one of those beginner mud runs, right? Like I'm definitely not your... Um, mud run Spartan girl, right? I don't fit that mold at all. But in order to push myself, I'm always setting goals. And some people are natural at setting goals where some people aren't, but I always have to have a finish line and to keep myself motivated. So it's something that I, that I do and I, I work for. And this is, it used to be called the dirty girl mud run and they've Ooh. removed, the, I know, right? It sounds, it sounds like my kind of mud run, uh, <laughs> but they removed the word dirty, but it is still a mud run and it's for every fitness level. And so now I've just decided that I need a fitness level. And so <laughs> <laughs> must attain a fitness level. I don't know what that will be by October, (laughs) uh, but I have two good friends that signed up to do it with me and we paid for it and we've got our registration and our time, our start time. So hopefully you'll be there at the finish line with, you know, I don't know, a gurney and a medical crew. There you go. There you go. (laughs) But so I have been thinking a lot about this because it's now July 1st. And in order for me to get to a point where I feel good about completing this mud run, I know that it's go time. I have got to start dedicating an hour a day to my workouts again. I mean, you know, with COVID, we all just kind of let things slide, right? Right. And I'm the worst of that because I am absolutely driven when I am focused on something and I go for it and I'm just 100% you know, head down, moving forward, right up until I'm just not focused on it anymore. And a lot of those drivers can be, you know, we get tired of it, or maybe impatient, or it's something that we once wanted that we just have lost sight of. Well, I am, from a fitness perspective, I'm that person that if you can get me through a series of a four day workout, I am committed, I will absolutely do it right up until I miss a four day round. And then once I miss that four day round, it's like something kicks in with me and I just think, nah, I'm cute the way I am. I don't need to work <laughs> out. So, and, and that's really my obstacle in my own life. And so I will be out there October 23rd with two of my friends and we will be muddy and sweaty and hot and we will complete that mud run. And so I need to set some goals today to get me to a point that I'm not half dead by the end of the mud run. Okay. So, so yeah, with that, I think, I think it's important to talk about it. And I know I made, you know, I made a little joke about this being a smart topic, but I, you know, in the corporate environment, we always talk about smart goals, right? And what smart goals are. And the truth is, is that everybody can set a goal, but there are components of a goal that you need to capture. So, you know, number one, you define where you want to be and then you work your way back into where you are now and you, you model what it needs to look like to get from point A to point B. So let's talk, let's talk about, let's talk about goal setting and what that means for people because I, you know, there are different, there are different facets of our life, right? Like some people have professional goals. Some people have personal goals, fitness, mental knowledge. And it's interesting because not everybody has the same weaknesses, right? So where, where I am, I can set a goal to go back to school because I have decided that I want to get a new degree in something. Um, I, I just do it without even thinking about it because that motivation is there. And it's a, it's a natural thing for me where I have a couple of friends who are health coaches and the fitness aspect of it is just a natural for them. So how do we get to a point where we make that unnatural, your, your baseline for success? Like how do you move into an arena where 
you're comfortable pursuing what you want? Is it defining what you want? I mean, I feel like that's the first step. Like, why do you want what you want? Right. And, you know, I've done actually quite a bit of work on in this subject. Um, and I've actually developed my own little formula that uh, I lovingly and blandly refer to as the four questions. And there are essentially four questions to anything you're doing in life. Now, this... The, the four questions apply very effectively from anything from goal setting to relationship building to, you know, business development. It just, it's all over the place really uh, in terms of how effective it becomes. And so what I'll usually do is take a client through the four questions, which are very, very simple. We start with that first question of what do you want, Right. So what do you want is just a very logical question. As we discussed a couple of weeks ago, people tend to make decisions, not tend, people 100% of the time make decisions based on an emotional stance. You make a decision and you feel your way to reason. So people tend to make the decision first based on emotion. Now, the only catch with that is in a material world, it's very difficult to choose something that is purely emotional and be able to attain it. What do you want? I want love. Okay, well, that's really hard to define. That is a different thing to just about everybody you ask. It's really difficult to take something that is so subjective and put it into a goal proposition, right? Mm -hmm. Because the, and a goal proposition is as simple as saying, when I have love, I will be happy. Now that goal proposition does not work. It's not executable because love is a subjective thing and happy is a subjective thing, right? Right. Sure. There's no way to, you're not going to chase the numbers on that. Like, how are you going to figure that out? It's absolute, it's absolutely unattainable. So if you, you have to have a goal proposition that uh, is more effective and that always starts with the logical question of what do you want? You've got to figure out what it is. And as we enter into the questions, you realize that you're still making a decision based on an emotional outcome, but you've got to tie that emotional outcome to something tangible. So mm -hmm. what do you want? I want a house in Tuscany. Yeah, great. A house in Tuscany sounds absolutely fantastic. Beautiful scenery, surreal and rural and provincial and all of the words that we associate with the pastoral life. But then you have to ask that second question in any goal set that you're, any goal proposition that you're formulating, which is why do you want that? And why is your emotional hook, right? Right. Why do you want a house in Tuscany? You know, I, I this reminds me of something that I don't want to get too far away from the, why do you want it only because, uh -huh. um, you know, I see, often I see people who will set goals and they're not necessarily goals that they want to achieve. They're goals that their loved ones want them to achieve. Um, so I just want to talk about that because, you know, we've all seen the movies that it reminds me of one of my favorite movies, French Kiss. Okay. And in that movie, Meg Ryan is deathly afraid of flying and her fiance is taking a trip to Paris and they live in Canada. And she hates flying. She doesn't like Paris. She doesn't want to go. And so she goes, there's a funny scene in the movie where she goes to a place to get over her fear of flying and they put her through this, you know, this simulation, this flight simulation. And it's really funny. But ultimately what it boiled down to is she was trying to live up to the goal of going to Paris because her fiance was absolutely insistent that they would just have this beautiful romantic trip. In the meantime, there's a house that is for sale in their neighborhood and she has saved her money and she's absolutely in love with this little house and they drive by it and he doesn't want the house and she doesn't want to go to Paris, but yet they're trying to make it work. So anyway, Long story short, he goes to Paris. He meets somebody else. He meets somebody that's probably better matched for him. And she decides she's going to face her fear and go get him back. And in the process, she finds herself. 
and, and she finds the right person that fits. And it's interesting because if you just take the relationship piece out of that, but you look at the goal setting, they both had goals that were, they weren't necessarily complementary, right? Like she was trying to overcome something and do something for him. And he was trying to mm, kind of do something for her, but it, it more freaked him out. And and if you look at that, how often, how often do we set goals? Because it's an expectation. So if I'm in my career and I'm really good at what I do and I deliver really well, then automatically everyone assumes that I want that next step up. But for some people, it might be a step sideways. It might be I'm in I'm in project management today, but tomorrow I want to move into business transformation. Right. It might not be I'm the best project manager boss there ever has been. And so now I want to be the boss of the bosses, right? It's not... It's not necessarily a move up. You have to identify why you want what you want, but what is the motivator behind the why? Typically, that problem can be fleshed out through the process of continuing to ask why, right? So if I ask you why you want your house in Tuscany and you say, because I love Roman architecture, okay, why do you love Roman architecture? People will continue to give you a logical response to the why question, which is an emotional question to which you have to ask yourself why once again, mm -hmm. until you finally find that place where your response is emotional and it always gets there, right? Be because the true driver for the decision that you think you are making is an emotional response to something. Without that emotional response, you really don't know your sincere why as far as anything you want. Because you think you just, you know, I want money. So you just really like pieces of paper, portraits of dead presidents, green on one side, gray on the other. <laughs> so beautiful. I love them. So let's talk about that in my, in my goal that I've set for myself. Like I'll, you know, I'll, I'll be the, I'll be the example for the intent of our conversation. So I randomly signed up for this, this mud run and I did it because I want to prove that I can do it. I want to prove to myself that I have what it takes at my age to accomplish that goal. Okay. So it's, it's, it's the feeling, the satisfaction, but it's also a motivation to get to a fitness level. <laughs> right. A fitness level, random. <laughs> a fitness level. Because so I can I'm say... not even on the scale. <laughs> <laughs> I realize it's an infinite continuum between death and Lance Armstrong. Death and. <laughs> but, but I'm not on the scale. I'm below dead. <laughs> uh, no, I'm not. It's not that bad. But, um, but it is a way. So the motivator is to get me to be more active and. And to set a goal, because I, like I said, I'm the, per I'm the person that needs a finish line, but it's the sheer emotional gratification of being able to complete okay. it. Okay. That's good. That's, That's good. And so, so there, I'm there, right? right? So the, like in a typical session, when I'm taking somebody through this whole program, there will be a, what do you want? And it's like, participate in the mud run, finish it. And I'll say, why do you want it? And, you know, people will give me a lot of different answers. Uh, support my friends, be there for others. I want to, you know, eventually they'll get to the point where they say, well, I just want to prove to myself that I can actually do this and finish it. Right. Which is good. They finally mm -hmm. get to an emotional response. It's I feel something because I want to feel something. Right. And so that's my why. And that is the dirty little secret is that is always the why. The only reason we ever do anything is so that we can feel a certain way. But now that's only half the equation. There are two more questions left. And those are the ones that actually motivate you to do something about it. Right? The third question. Mm -hmm. Okay. So just to, I'll back up a little bit. First, you have a logical question. What? What do you want? Then an emotional question. Why? Why do you want it? Right? The third question is emotional with pain. Because people will do more to avoid pain than they will ever, ever do to seek pleasure. That's fair. We would much rather avoid the pain 
than seek the pleasure. I remember hearing an example once upon a time where if I were to tell you, you've got a hundred thousand dollars in a safe in your bedroom and somebody's got the combination and they're coming to get it. What would you do to protect that hundred thousand dollars? And the answer is you'd go to virtually any length. I'd buy guns. I'd buy a dog, put a fence up around the house. I would, I would go to any length to protect that hundred thousand dollars. Now, if I told you, Hey, there is this incredible opportunity for you to make a hundred thousand dollars. What would you do to earn the money? And the answer is you do a lot less. And I don't mean a little bit. I mean a lot profoundly less. You'd kind of roll your eyes and sit down and you get two friends and they get two friends, you know, or whatever, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not that I'm bragging on network marketing. I have a lot of clients over the years in network marketing. They've been incredibly successful. But, but that's kind of the shortcut is that you would do far more right. to keep from losing something or avoiding pain than you would do to earn something or gain pleasure. That's a recognizable part of the human condition. So that leads us into the third question that I would ask the client in a session like this. And I would say, so tell me this, we've established that you want to go to the mud run and complete it. You want to prove you can do it at this age. You want to feel good about yourself, feel complete and, and like you're still got it and you're still in the game. Very viable reasoning. But the real question is, why haven't you done it already? <laughs> that is the big question. I would have to say in this, I mean, for me, I'll be completely honest with our 14 listeners, by the way, we're up, uh, we're up four people. So thanks for joining y'all. Um, I, I, because I am so laser focused when I have a goal where I struggle personally is with balancing goals across different spectrums of my life. So uh, when I focus on my professional goals, like I, you know, a couple of promotions over less than three years is pretty, pretty commendable considering I've been with the company for, you know, 18 years. And now all of a sudden I'm moving, I'm moving up very quickly. And, um, it's because I, it's where my focus has been when, when truthfully the happiness that we, that we have and, and anyone who is truly well-rounded and successful, they have that balance of goals. And so it's not just I'm focused on my career or I'm focused on my health or I'm focused on my, um, my intellectual state of being. I'm, you know, my spiritual state of being, you actually are completing a combination of both of them and you may not get an immediate result in all of them. Uh, but if you're, if you're focused on one aspect of your life, then if you're laser focused on one aspect of your life, then all of the others kind of go to the wayside. And, and that's why people have problems in relationships when they're, when they're working so much and it, that work takes them out of the home. And then all of a sudden they're, you know, working on, on their professional goals and they've forgotten their relationship goals. Mm -hmm. And so, so for me, because I am so focused and where I put my attention is where I move forward, I am having to learn to balance and say, it's okay to have that work-life balance. It's okay to pursue a romantic relationship. It's okay to pursue intellectual advancements. It's okay to go get into a mud run. Now, with that being said, you, I also have to be vigilant in the way that I attack things because I, I can't look at the big goal in front of me as this giant wall that I have to climb in one shot, right? Nobody, how do you eat an elephant, right? The, the, the saying, how do you eat an elephant? You eat an elephant one bite at a time. And so that's where in working with, in working with clients and working with people, you have to break down the milestones that you need to accomplish to get to the goal. So it's very much like project managing your life. Yes, it is. It is. But here's the thing. While that entire diatribe was thoroughly fascinating. <laughs> tell me something. It was well-spoken, articulate, beautiful. Sound, it was mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank border, you. Thank bordering you. on political even. It was just, it was glorious. You have not... <laughs> 
done the mud run in however many years. I think you used to do these things, didn't you? Like way back. Yeah. But, but yeah. so, it's, but it's been a few years. Let's be fair. You, oh, so yeah. you, it's been like eight so years. You have ignored this aspect of your life for eight years, even though you want to do it because of the way it makes you feel. And so why haven't you done it in the last eight years? I didn't want it bad enough. Pretty good. Yeah, that you're you're on the right path. That's a pretty good answer. And so I'll just kind of cut to the chase uh, because, you know, when we're doing these exploration sessions, I mean, they can go on a couple of hours, right? They're just, it's, it, right, totally. there's a lot of like a little blood and guts and little blubbery tears on both sides of the desk. <laughs> I'm, I'm crying with the client. Oh my God, that's terrible. <laughs> I, know, I know. You know how that is, right? And that's, <laughs> I mean, you can only really, you find a way to help somebody just by being truly empathetic to their situation and their needs. And if you can't compassionately put yourself into somebody else's shoes, it's really hard to, to help them find the way out of the muck and the mire. Nonetheless, the answer to this question always boils down to, I suck. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so why haven't you done it? Well, because Tim, I suck. And, suck. and it doesn't have to be in that brutal of terms, right? It can be as simple as I just haven't wanted it bad enough. I haven't put forth the effort. The important part of that uh, inflection point in the conversation, though, is I hear somebody taking personal responsibility for the position they're in. That's, oh, that's yeah. the most Big important one. part. So what do you want? Logical question, logical answer. I want to do the mud run in your case. Why do you want it? I want to feel a certain way. I want to feel good about myself. I want to feel empowered, right? Which implies that you feel like, at least on a physical level, you have been slowly losing power, right? And so you want to reinvigorate, re-empower yourself. Why don't you have it right now? All I need is for you to say, hey, that's on me, buddy. I made the decisions. I sat on my ass. I had every opportunity to change my world. I didn't do it. I didn't take the opportunity because on some level I suck. And that's okay because we all suck, right? We're all really bad at a lot of these things. Sure. And, and I mean, look at what we just came out of, right? Like how motivated were people during COVID? All of a sudden, we we receded to our homes, locked our doors, closed our blinds, and sat here for a year waiting for a pandemic to pass. And, and you know, that wasn't everyone, but the majority of people, they there there's a certain level of emotional and social anxiety and depression and detachment. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I told friends that I was about two steps away from having a volleyball named Wilson, <laughs> you, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and even though, you know, we did these virtual happy hours and we did um, virtual movies and, you know, it's, it's not the same especially if you're social. I mean, obviously there's a subset of the population that are introverts and they were completely fine. I, I tend to be, um, an extrovert. However, I like to have downtime where I am more introverted. Right. That, that being said, there are, there are emotional barriers that will sometimes prevent you from, moving past them, but it always comes back down to the eye suck. Right. Right. Like I didn't want it. I didn't want it bad enough. I was sitting here in lounge pants, taking conference calls for a year. It, it does change the way that we see things. And now that we're moving past this, past this pandemic and past this era, people want to feel like I want to be alive. I want to have fun. I want to go out and, and meet people and, and do fun things and, and, you know, go out on dates and go to dinner and, and just experience life and experience the human connection because I have been starved from it for so long. And I know that I'm not the only one. Right. I'm probably the norm at this point. I'm probably one of few people that live out in this desert and, you know, had to order stuff on Amazon just to see that the Amazon driver still existed. <laughs> there you go. My friend, here comes my friend. <laughs> You're here. You brought wine. No. <laughs> 
but um but it's it's true though i mean we we did a lot of staying in and there's no motivation to evolve when everything feels like it's at a standstill right right so yeah we all suck right and we need to get out there and redefine our goals that's it that's absolutely it which leads us to the fourth question and it hinges on the notion of project managing your life, which if you want something in life, you have to project manage it. There are very few people in life who, whatever they want and just the way they want it lands on their doorstep. It happens once in a while, I suppose I've heard tales, but it just really doesn't happen often enough for you to count on that. Right. It's not, it's not really a game plan. Right. I mean, I remember saying to you just last week, the the whole notion of uh, if you want somebody to ride in on a white horse and save somebody, you better buy yourself a white horse and learn to ride it because that's the only way it's going to happen. <laughs> you get, so you better get your white horse and find somebody to ride in and save because the overwhelming odds are that's the only way you're going to experience such a thing in your life. Even though right. in the world of fairy tales, it's that's the you know, idiom that it's built around. I don't know if idiom is the right word, but I, it sounds idiotic. So I like it. Idiom. <laughs> it's not going to happen is the short story. You're freaking kidding yourself. Nobody's riding in on a white horse to save you. If you want to save up by a white horse and go ride out and save somebody else, well then by all means take Polaroids. Cause like, <laughs> cause it doesn't happen very often. Nobody's going to believe it, but it, but it really does lead to that fourth question. Uh, which now we revert back to a logical question. So just to reiterate, we've had logical question, logical answer. What do you want, mud run? Why do you want it? Emotional question, emotional answer. I want it because it makes me feel good about myself and who I am. Why don't you have it now? Because, again, emotion with pain. I, I take personal responsibility for the position that I'm in, i.e. I suck. Now, obviously, not everybody just sucks. But you know what I mean? It's about taking personal responsibility for the position you're in. Yeah. Because until you do that, there's no way you're ever going to change it. And that leads us to the fourth question, which goes back to logic. And that question is how? And the question simply stated is, if we can figure out how to get you to the mud run on time <laughs> with a physical fitness level... <laughs> <laughs> with a just a fitness level, yeah, with a yeah fitness that's all I want. Level. Well, and hopefully a fitness level. Maybe we'll push our goals up a little bit higher, and say <laughs> a fitness level requisite to complete said race. Right, right, right. And if we can sit here together, put our heads together, pad of paper and pen in hand, and figure out exactly how we're going to do that. Is that what you want to do? Yeah. And the answer is always yes. The answer is always yes. And then it comes down to making a list and checking the boxes, figuring out exactly what you want. Okay. Now that's what I, that's mm -hmm. what I call the hierarchy of wants. That's the next step from the four questions. You go into your hierarchy of wants. Because a lot of people want a lot of things, but a lot of those things don't necessarily work together. I want to eat pie three meals a day and reduce my risk of heart disease, right? So number one, <laughs> yeah, me number too. one is pie three meals a day. Number, number two, res reduce my risk of heart disease. Number three, cure my diabetes, right? And it's like, <laughs> okay, all right, those are all, the, like, those are all, while in different facets, those are all very admirable goals, and I can agree with all three of them. However, you've got to decide between those three which ones you want more, and the ones you want more tend to bump the ones you want less completely off the list, right? That's true. So anytime you have a, a, a dichotomy there, anytime you have two particular goals that completely fight against each other. One of them's got to go. And you go through that little hierarchy of, of wants. Here's exactly what I want. And here's the associated, how I'm going to get it. Want number one, 
cure my diabetes. How? Stop eating pie. <laughs> right? Three meals a day. Stop eating pie <laughs> three meals a day. And you just mm -hmm. and you just go through that process of here's what I want, how I'm gonna get it, and what I want, how I'm gonna get it. And then, you know, from there you could you calendarize the whole thing, right? So it's like, here's how I live and what I do. And you've only got to do it for 28 short days and you're on a brand new path because that's how long it takes for the human psyche to adapt to a new pattern. It's 28 days. So that, that's why so many of the, uh, you know, the drug rehab programs, 28 days, mm -hmm. you, they put you in for 28 days because in 28 days you form a new pattern and with a new pattern, in about a year, you'll have a new paradigm. And with a new paradigm, you're unlimited. You're unstoppable. You've got to decide what your paradigm is and then craft a paradigm that serves you and then execute the paradigm moving forward. And you're unstoppable. Well, and you know, I, I have to, I have to talk about this because we're talking about goal setting. I want to talk about the subset of our clients who, cause we both have had them. I know we have, we've had this conversation, the subset of clients that we work with that really want something, but they let their fears or their, um, their belief systems get in their way. Right. And I know that we, we just have to push forward for 28 days and, and we build that new paradigm, but I think they're you know, how do you coach? Cause I'll tell you, I've had a couple of clients where, you know, they want to change their career. So they want to move from what they're doing today into something completely different. And you, you go through the, why do you want it? And there's a barrier between the why and how are you going to get there? And a lot of that has to do with the mental cycle that we go through and the, the things that we tell ourselves where I'm not good enough or well, I want it one day. Mm -hmm. Well, that one day, one day is always today. Right. One, one day is always today. If it's not today, it's never. And so if you want something, you have to go for it today because tomorrow is never guaranteed. And so I think it's important to, to set up a contingency planning to help counter those negative thoughts, right? So when you have those, well, if I write a book, people might not buy it. Okay. <laughs> Are you writing, are you writing it to make strangers happy or are you writing it for the accomplishment? Right. Right. And that's, that's, that's what you have to determine. So there are, there are, there is a subset of questions that you need to ask yourself if you are one of those people that you have this pie in the sky idea. I'm, I swear we've said pie so many times. I'm going to have to go <laughs> bake one after this. Um, pie. but you, <laughs> You're, you're missing that, uh, chocolate pecan bourbon mm -hmm. pie, right? <laughs> I knew it. Um, but you know, that you have to, do you want to do this because you want to make strangers happy or do you want to do this because you want the accomplishment? Cause I promise you on October 23rd in Phoenix, Arizona, I'm going to show up to that mud run and I am going to work my tail off and get through that mud run. And guess what? The only people that are really going to be satisfied with my performance is me and maybe you at the finish line yeah. with, you know, Bo and Josh and Annie. <laughs> Woohoo! Aunt Carrie did it. Right? Like nobody, nobody else is going to care. Right. But I will care. And, and, and that's what a goal is. Your goals are very personal. If I want to start a business or I want to start some kind of endeavor to add a layer to my experience in life or, or my profession or something that I do, I don't do it to make you happy. I do it to make me happy. Right. And, and the, you know, well, and the sad truth of that is that we can't do it to make strangers happy, but we also can't do it to make friends happy or family happy or significant oh. others happy. And that's, right. that's where it gets a little bit dicey, right? Because we desperately want people in our lives to be happy. But if we are going to make them happy at our own personal expense, at our own loss of happiness, then that's also a bad move. 
And that's another kind of weird, quirky little part of the human condition. To answer the question, though, uh, I think that boils back down into that hierarchy of wants. You know, I want, I mean, one of my things could be, I want to make my friends and family happy, right? Mm -hmm. But then as you continue to develop those wants and you realize that staying in the solid, secure, well-paying job that I have right now is going to make my family very happy. But I want to change careers to do something that I actually enjoy. And, you know, it's, I remember, man, I gave this talk one time to a communications department at a, a medium sized college, about 15,000 kids. And I was talking to this one kid who was kind of not really made an example, but just there was interchange back and forth between me and the audience, between me and the communications department. And this one guy is asking me about uh, just about what he should do moving forward. And essentially what he was doing was he was out uh, selling insurance. He had been selling insurance for a couple of years. He was a non-traditional student, a few years older, probably 27, 28. And he was selling insurance for a living. And uh, insurance, as fun as actuary tables sound, that's not what you do. <laughs> As fun as that sounds, that's not what you, oh. that's not what you do as an agent, okay? Uh, as an agent, I've had several agents that I've worked with over the years. As an agent, what you do is you invite people in your target demographic to a free lunch, where you educate them about insurance and how it works. Right? Here's what life insurance is. Basically, the insurance company is. Uh, betting that you're going to stay alive every month and you're betting that this month is the month you die, right? <laughs> and so you put down a little bit of money and if you're right and you die, they got to pay big. You're not around to enjoy it, but man, do they, they really have to pay. I mean, you could put down term insurance, you could put down 20, 25 bucks a month and they'd have to pay 200 grand the month you actually kick off if you're right. <laughs> right. Now, the reason it survives as a business is that you don't want to be right and they don't want you to be right. But the moral of the story is with this kid is that selling insurance is a very social game. You are constantly meeting people and talking to people and asking them about their lives. And you're putting on these luncheons and inviting people out to a free lunch that you're paying for so they can listen to you, you know, hopefully make them laugh and be charming and teach them how insurance works and why they might want to get some and, uh, you know, collect contact information so that you go over and sit down and look at them on a, on a personal level. And that's what insurance agents do. The short story is they are party animals. You wouldn't think so, right? <laughs> do you remember Ned from Groundhog Day? Yes. Groundhog Day, if there's anybody on the planet who has not seen it, which I would be surprised because it's a very popular film that's very old. So spoiler alerts ahead. Bill Murray plays a character who's living the same day over and over and over. And one of the interchanges he has in that day is he runs into Ned from high school, who's now an insurance salesman. And Ned is just, you know, dry and boring and tedious and crass. And he's sort of a, the butt of a lot of jokes. Everybody kind of hates Ned. But that's not what a real insurance agent looks like or is or does. These guys are like playing a lot of golf and having a lot of lunch and they're clever and funny and charming and they have a capacity to explain things to you. This guy asks me about his career in the insurance field, which I'm kind of going, I'm curious, like, why are you studying communications? Uh, which this, his particular emphasis was in broadcast media. Why are you studying broadcast media? If, uh, and the broadcast media think of, uh, newscasters, sports announcers, that, which in fact, that was his dream. Well, he wanted to be a sportscaster, right? Sure. Love sports, love to talk, love to look at the camera, had really good hair. And that's kind of what he was interested in. And so he's selling insurance. And so I'm going, so 
you know, do you just really love going out there and kind of meeting people and shaking hands and, you know, talking to people about their lives and their kids and their hopes and their dreams? Uh, and he's like, well, no, I, I kind of hate that part of it. And I'm like, dude, that's the only part of it. It's like, that's the, <laughs> that's like the biggest, part that's the right whole there. job description. <laughs> Here's what I said to him then as he's explaining to me the fact that he, he hates his job. And I'm just like, so I'm, I'm asking him, so why do you continue if you, if you really hate it so much? And he said, well, because I make really good money. You know, I've got mm -hmm. a wife, I've got a kid, I've got to be responsible. Kudos to you. I respect that. I make really good money. I'm making really good money, especially for my age. More than any of his contemporaries, he was just doing pretty well. And I said, let me tell you about the path you're on, chief. The path you're on is that you are going to, if you choose to stay in the insurance business that you hate so much, you're going to continue to do a reasonably good job because as you pointed out, you're making really good money now. Chances are you're going to make really good money in the future. And then once, once your, you know, your renewals start to build up 10, 12, 15 years down the line, forget about it, right? You, you're going to make a ton sure. of money just doing a lot less work. And so what you're going to have to do, given that you hate the behavior that you're engaged in every time you go out and sell insurance, you, be, you, you dislike the behavior. And yet you've got to behave that way in order to make the money. You will find yourself a few short years from now, and you're going to come home every night. And every night there on the desk of your home office, you're going to have to make a choice on one side. There's a bottle of whiskey, and on the other side of your desk, there's a bullet, okay? <laughs> and every day of your life moving forward, you're going to have to choose bottle of whiskey or bullet, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the problem with sure. doing something you hate and staying with it. You get out of it by really examining that hierarchy of wants and figuring out what you want. What he want was making his wife and his child very happy, certainly well cared for, but he was miserable. And it only takes two, three, four, five, up to maybe 10 or 12 years of miserable before, before there's, mm -hmm. you know, self treatment in the form of maybe an alcohol addiction or a drug addiction or things really fall apart pretty fast. Humans are not good at being unhappy for extended period of time. Agreed. They're just not. And, and crap hits the fan. Things fall apart in just a few scant years. It's going to be whiskey or a bullet. I, I will tell you that I knew I, it's funny that you mentioned that because I knew a guy when he had just gotten out of high school and this guy had wanted to go into a medical field his whole entire life. Okay. His entire life. And so we graduate from high school. We go our separate ways. Later on, I sync up with him like five, 10 years down the road and he's married and he is in pharmaceutical sales. And I asked him, I, I, what, what happened? Like, what happened to your dream? And, and he said, well, you know, my, my wife's father is in this business. And because he's in this business, I was going to college and it just, you know, it just made sense for me to go into the same business that her father was in. He was absolutely miserable. And so the truth of, of it all right now, if there's anything else that, that we could say, it would be that the people who really love you want you to be happy pursuing your own dreams. And so if you're with someone that has some unrealistic expectation that you need to live up to their measure of success versus yours, you are with the wrong person. Right. And that's tough news too. Mm -hmm. That's more bad news. But you've got to figure that out going in. You, you've got to know right. what is going on with the person that you choose to spend your life with, which so many of us do. So many people do go out there and find the one. And that's a bit of a misnomer, but we won't, I will save that for a different podcast. Yeah. Uh, 
but yeah, it's, I don't know. I remember uh, some sales training way back in the day by a guy by the name of Brian Tracy. And he's talking about developing a business and he's looking at it from the perspective of, is there anything in your life that you would undo? If you could go back and not have hired your son-in-law to be in the pharmaceutical sales business because you knew it would make him wildly unhappy, then you need to go in today and fire him. Right. For his own sake, for your sake, for the future, for your daughter, whatever it is. And obviously I'm looking at that from a different perspective than your friend. Well, they ultimately divorced. They ultimately divorced. That's what happens. That's what happens. It's a metaphorical whiskey or a bullet, but that's what happens. He put a bullet in the head of the marriage because he just mm -hmm. could not go on that way. And the thing is, people think that it will somehow be easier in time. So, you know, you're this snot-nosed kid, 22, 23, 25. You're slinging insurance. You're making pretty good money. You're selling pharmaceuticals. You're making pretty good money. So now you push that down 10, 12 years. The average marriage lasts 16 years. You get around to your average number, your 16 year number. And now you're making twice as much money, right? You think your husband, wife, significant other is going to say, yeah, that sounds awesome. So it turned out all this time you wanted to be a professional bass fisherman. Cool. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's get a second mortgage on the house. I'll stop going to the country club and we're going to get you a nice bass boat and start traveling around to bass fishing tournaments. I promise you that's not going to happen. As a matter of fact, he or she significant other is going to feel like they have been lied to and tricked and neglected. You have said something by virtue of your actions that you're now telling me is untrue. Why didn't you tell me 15, 20 years ago that you wanted to be a professional bass fisherman? You know? Because I because I was trying to make you happy is that's the answer. I was trying the to make problem. you happy. That's it. Uh huh. That's it. You have to make yourself happy. I was trying to say what you wanted to hear. I was putting on a freaking show. I was singing and dancing and juggling, tap dancing to try to make you happy. I wanted you to have what you wanted. I was trying to be what you told me would get me laid. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. Oh, I was trying so to tell sad. you. Sorry, mom. I was trying to yeah. tell you what you, what you taught me would, would make you happy and thus make my life easier. I didn't make decisions for myself. I didn't think about myself. I thought about you and I gave you what I thought you wanted. And the sad truth of the matter is if you had showed up, and said, look, I'm going to be a professional bass fisherman. She either would have said, all right, well, I'm kind of looking for a successful, um, you know, pharmaceutical rep. So we're probably not a good fit, but hey, thanks for the you know, drink or whatever. Right. Or mm -hmm. maybe she says, oh my gosh, my granddaddy was a professional bass fisherman. That's just the coolest job in the world. Didn't make a ton of money and we probably won't either, but I know going in. Right. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, it's okay. Maybe we will, maybe we get super lucky and you're super talented and we actually do really well. The trick is being really, really, really super self-aware and super true to yourself and then share that with any potential mate. It could be that your particular passion in life and what you would be happy doing precludes you from being in a relationship with anybody. Right. I, I want to be a professional mercenary and carry a gun around the world and jump out of airplanes. I want to shoot zombies and okay, dude, ain't no girl in their right mind or guy for that matter going to say, Oh yeah, that sounds good. I'll just be home knitting. You know, I hope to see you at Christmas time that, you know, maybe what you want precludes you being in that relationship. And so when you look on your hierarchy of wants and you see professional mercenary is number one and happily married is number two, well, happily married probably needs to be pushed on down the list a little bit. Right. Because happily married really gets in the way of being a professional mercenary. <laughs> yeah, it totally does. 
You know, I I think I think you're right. Although, I mean, would I get like every other weekend? Because I'm not signed up for that. <laughs> there you go. I'm open, folks. I'm uh, I'm flexible. Go fight your zombies. I'll see you every other weekend and holidays. Yeah. I could deal with that. Yeah, no. Work. No, but no, it's, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, we're saying the same thing, right? At the, at the end of the day, you, if you're with somebody who can't love you for who you want to be in your life, then you're with the wrong person, but you have to, you have to take a stand for yourself. You can't just conform and then blame them. At the end of the day, you have to be able to stand up and say, look, this is what I want to do. This is what makes me happy. And if you if it doesn't make you happy or you can't support me in my happiness, then you can't support who I am as a person. That's right. Yeah. What your significant other is telling you is if you have not stood up for yourself and claimed who and what you want to be in a thoroughly honest fashion, that significant other being incensed and hurt and perhaps demanding a divorce and blaming you for it is completely right because it's your fault because you didn't claim who you were from the word go. You didn't have the backbone. You didn't have the guts to just be exactly who you are right from the opening curtain. And so now you've been, now you've, been to extend that metaphor. You've been playing a part the whole time. And now 15 and a half, 16 years later, you want to play the part you were born for. Turns out I'm a soprano, right? Mm -hmm. And you want to sing the parts written for you. And she's been fooled or he's been fooled for a decade and a half. And, And is that your fault? Well, you're right. You're exactly right. Of course, that's your fault. You've been lying to him or her by lying to yourself for a decade and a half. So, yep, that's your fault. Time to own that now. When You'll find that you're much better off, as you said just a few moments ago, to just thoroughly self-aware and be exactly who you are for that person. Let them make an educated decision. Because they can decide, yeah, mercenary, sweet. Or they can say, mm, I'm going to hold out for that pharmaceutical rep. That's, I mean, that's, that's what it, that's what it boils down to. So ultimately why we, why we haven't gotten there. What are the, what are the four there's let's recap. So let's just recap. Yeah. So the, the methodology is to decide exactly what you want. And we know that, don't confuse what with why. We know that what you want is to be happy or whatever. Great, right? Mm -hmm. That's what everybody wants. That's the what. And so you've got to be very careful using the pattern, creating the the equation, right? You've got Mm -hmm. to be very careful about linking that to something tangible because the formula doesn't work as well if you don't. What do you want? And it can be a mud runner house in Tuscany, a sailboat. It can be a big box of money. Give me a what. From the what, I need to know why. You've got to define your motive. If you don't know your why, you will never have your what. It just doesn't matter. Fill in the blank any way you'd like. You've got to understand your why. And the why is an emotional question. It always comes down to, I want to feel a certain way. I want to see myself in a certain light. From there, you've got to explore the dark side of your why, which is you say you want a sailboat, a house in Tuscany, a mud run, doesn't matter what it is, a box of money. You say you want these things. And yet look around in your life. Do you see these things? Do you see this particular thing? Because if you don't, then you obviously don't want it as bad as you're saying you want it. Otherwise you would have it. And so what I need a client to do at that juncture is to jump in and say, oh my gosh, I could have created that in the last 10, 15 years easily. I didn't. I let it go. 
It was super, super important to me, and I didn't even try. I suck, which is to say I am responsible for everything that I've done leading up to this point where I don't have the thing, the thing that is so pivotal to my happiness. is It's my fault. It's my doing. I cheated myself. That's great. As long as you can be responsible for it, you can change it. And so then we go to the fourth question, which is how, how are you going to get what you want? Let's talk about how you get exactly what you want. And just make sure that you, you, you tackle it one bite at a time. You work through the beliefs that you've set up for yourself that have kept you from what you really want and how you want to get there. And, you know, I have to say, we have to, we have to wrap this up and put a bow on it by, by saying, because we both are in the coaching world, if you can't do it by yourself, you hire someone to help you go through the experience. You hire a coach, That's bring correct. a coach in, a co- even coaches need coaches. Who do you yep. think I... I call you when I need to be coached, you, you know, go. like I get it. that's, that's what we do. And so, yep. you know, you hire a coach, you have them present, you have them be your accountability and you have them help teach you to be accountable to yourself and the desires of your heart. That's right. I mean, that's, you have to. That's right. Nobody does their own dental work. The most acute <laughs> nose in the world, the most capable nose in the world cannot tell the human being whose mouth it sits directly above if they have bad breath or not. <laughs> because they're both exhaling at the same time. It can't tell you. You've got to have a third party to help you with things like that. And, you know, oftentimes, to be fair, not everybody can just like throw a bunch of money at at you know, hiring somebody to take, get them to the next level. Uh, but there are a lot of good books out there that can serve as, as, as a coach to you. Right. I mean, there's a lot of good affordable ways to, to know people who really can give you a lot of insight just by reading their words from the past. You know, you don't have to throw a bunch of money at changing your life for the better, but you do have to change your life for the better. Uh, because if you don't, your life will be short and miserable. Agreed. Agreed. And be with somebody that wants you to be happy more than they want what they want. No, I disagree with that one. <laughs> or I disagree with the phraseology. Of that, okay. All right. right. All right. Want what you want and pursue it and be with someone who wants what they want and make sure that those wants coalesce into a path that you can walk together. That's fair. I like that. That's that's good. There is no sacrifice to being with someone. You know, people I've heard all my life, you know, relationships are hard and marriage is hard and building a business is hard. And, and, and you know what? It's hard if you make it harder, if you allow it to be hard. But if you are just completely... First, self-aware, second, boldly honest, and willing to walk away from anyone who does not fit into what you're creating with your life. Right. Then you'll be fine. You will find your person. True. Or maybe you won't. Maybe you're a mercenary. Maybe whatever you do, it just doesn't work in that regard. But at any rate, you will find your happiness. And that's really the secret. Agreed. I like it. All right. Cool, cool. Well, in that case, we will wrap it up. All right. Sounds good. Until next week. And uh, make sure uh, I would like to invite all of our 15 listeners to come out to the Mud Run Finish Line October 23rd. I'll be there. All right. Sounds good. (laughs) All right. Until then, dream your life. And live your dreams. (laughs) Bye. Bye. 